So I want to kick off this new year with this new series called Foundations. And basically what Foundations are, and or what the series is going to be, is these are things we are going to build off of for this year. This is our, our foundation for the year, and then we can move forward with these things in mind going forward. Now, um, I, I don't think it's a new year without me starting off a service without a soccer reference, so here we go. Um, so I was, I just by happenstance, this was pure random chance or, you know, the working of the Holy Spirit in my life at the moment, whichever one you think is correct. Um, I saw a video of a retired soccer player, uh, Jimmy Conrad, if you've, if you've watched the Kansas City Wizards when they were the Wizards or when they changed over to Sporting Kansas City. Uh, he was one of the center backs. He's one of their legends of, of Sporting Kansas City, Sporting Legends. And he was taking questions, and somebody asked him this question. They said, how do I become a professional scout for a soccer team? Which seems like a very like niche career to have like a, a an obvious career path to lead to, and here's what he said. He said, "Go get your coaching badges." He didn't say, "Go learn how to look at a player." Don't 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 go to more games. He said, "Go get your coaching badges," which coaching badges are basically soccer's way of certifying that you actually know what you're doing and you can be hired for jobs as a coach. And so they went, and he told him to go get that. Then he was like, here's the interesting thing about becoming a professional in, in this realm. You, if you want to be a scout, you're going to need to know how to coach because you're going to need to know what coaches are looking for in a player. Then he said, and, and the great thing is, as you start down this journey, as you go into these classes to get your certification for coaching, you're going to meet people that are going to carry you down that same path. They're going down that same path. Maybe you meet somebody in there that 20 years down the road is, is the head coach of a team, and you've now got a network with a head coach of a team down the road. I think the person that was asking him the question wanted the easy answer of like, well, you do this one thing, and then you submit an application, and you got it. But there's all these other things that go into the ultimate destination that that, that person was looking for. And I think that's kind of what we're looking at right here today is that just because we, we have this, this future thing in mind, this future thought, this future place that we want to arrive at, it's not a quick fix. There is no quick solution to get to the end. There's a road you start down that you arrive at. And we're going to look at this phrase in the book of Nehemiah. He says this. Uh, he says, here's what he says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. But guess what? This situation that Nehemiah speaks that exact sentence in is, is a little surprising. Most people know Nehemiah as the guy who rebuilt the wall around, around Jerusalem. That was his job. We are going to look at the one chapter that basically has nothing to do with the main purpose of his entire life. It's Nehemiah chapter 8. He's this famous builder, but we want to look at something that isn't his famous construction. He, along with this guy named Ezra, decide to gather all the people together and to read the scriptures to the people so they can hear the word of the Lord. So they do this, and the people of Israel, they start weeping and mourning. They hear the word of God. They hear the scriptures. They hear the law of Moses. They hear what they should be doing, realizing they have not been doing it. And then weep and mourn in repentance. And here's the interesting thing that Ezra and Nehemiah say to the people. Here's what it says. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who were interpreting for the people, said to them, don't mourn or weep on such a day as this, for today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah continued, go and celebrate with a feast of rich food and sweet drinks. 
and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected or sad. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. That's that, that's that wonderful phrase. You've probably heard it before and you maybe didn't know that it came from Nehemiah chapter 8. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And that's one of the things that I really want us to lay a foundation for this year. Is that the joy of the Lord really is our strength. The joy of the Lord our God will sustain us. And here's one of the cool things as, as you look at this pattern and what they do right after they do this big celebration, they, they go and they celebrate the Festival of Tabernacles, which I don't know if you guys know this, but God literally writes into the law that we should celebrate. He literally writes it in that we should have these, or in, in the Old Testament law, that they should celebrate these festivals to remember what God has done. But there seems to be a pattern here. And I think it's kind of got four steps. They read the scriptures, they repent, they celebrate, and then they obey. It's kind of this, this process. So reading the scriptures, I think we, this is an area where we've got to embed these things into the patterns of our life, into the habits of our life. We have to read the word of God. There's no more direct, more clear way that God has communicated to us as human beings than through his scriptures. There's nothing in, in all of creation that God has like already been like, hey, this is the Bible, read it. That's why we're doing this 90-day plan through the New Testament, because guess what? When we read God's word, it's probably the most e easy way to understand wh what he wants from us. He sets up these guidelines. He sets up these, these things that guide our life, and he, and he tells us where we should go on things. The second is to repent. And I know even as I was writing the word repent, that sometimes feels like aggressive or intrusive. But guess what? Repentance is not, is not that. It's funny because I think sometimes when we hear the word repentance or we hear, hear like saying that we need to repent, we're like, whoa, how dare you assume that about me? But everyone knows we all mess up. Everyone knows that. I screw up. You screw up. Everybody does. It's just part of life that we mess up. It's no surprise. It's no surprise if you're wondering and you have a spouse in the room whether or not you mess up, just turn and look at them, you know? It's like that's the easiest way to, to, to have that determination. We know each other. We know we're human. We know we mess up. Repentance is purely understanding that we did something wrong, and we do that all the time. It's kind of like, you know, those, those, those moments, whether it's with your spouse, your significant other, a friend, a parent, there's that moment where you're like doing something that is like, it's not like sin either way, right? It's like, it's not going to be like sinning if you like mount the TV this way or that way, you know? It's just, you have an opinion and the other person has an opinion. You decide to go with your opinion you carry on down that road. You arrive at the conclusion that that road was not the right road. And then you go back to the other person and they could be like, I told you so. I told you so. But instead, they just look at you and you look at them and you're like, I should have done it your way. And they look back at you and you're like, yeah. That's repentance. That's what repentance is. We make this out to be this, this really challenging thing, but guess what? God wants what's best for you. God wants what's best for you. So when you go back to God and go, yeah, I definitely should have done it your way, God. He's like, yeah. Now we're cool again. That we, we make this thing out to be this like daunting thing when really it's just us reconciling ourselves to God. 
just like we would with a friend or, or, or our family or anybody. That's what repentance is. It's simply acknowledging that we messed up and that the other way was the far better way. And then, okay, so that's read the scriptures, read, repent. Now one that I really enjoy, celebrate. Celebrate. So they, they tell all the people, they tell all the people, hey, go make a party. Go prepare the best food. And hey, if anybody doesn't have anything, you invite them over because they need to celebrate at, at the high end level that you are. That if and anybody couldn't like, it, it's one commentator I read, he was like, basically what, the, what, the, what Nehemiah is telling the people is like, hey, go get your prime rib and your filet mignon and do it up because God is good. That's basically what they're saying. Take, they even use like the richest foods. They literally say the richest, like they use talking about how you should have a party and have great food. That's what the deal is. We need to read the word. We need to see where we've gone wrong, repent, and then the party. Because it's always worth celebrating when, when we were not in right standing and we've been brought back into right standing with God. When we've repented of our sin, it's always worth celebrating it. It's always worth celebrating it. There's not a single thing that like you shouldn't celebrate when you're moving towards righteousness. That's what, that's what Nehemiah is trying to communicate, and that's why he says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Celebrate with God when good things happen. Celebrate with God when God is good in your life. Celebrate with God when you're brought back to right standing with him. Celebrate with God when, when a relationship is mended. Celebrate with God when, when he provides for you. Celebrate with God in every single moment. So, maybe last year didn't feel like the most celebratory year ever. That's okay. But I was thinking about, you know, have you ever thought about um, people that celebrate month anniversaries? Month anniversaries? You've, heard, you've seen this maybe on social media or you've been around a teenager at any point. Um, and they're like, we celebrated a two-month anniversary. One, anniversary is rooted in the word annual, which means year. And normally I would end the conversation there just trolling that whole concept. But I may have been slightly convicted of that mentality as I'm reading these scriptures. You know what's interesting about somebody who celebrates month anniversaries? They're looking for excuses to celebrate. They're looking for excuses to celebrate the person they're with. They're looking for excuses to just have some joy. When was the last time you looked for an excuse to celebrate God? When was the last time you, you were like, hey, that's my two month anniversary in the Bible plan. We're celebrating. That's what this, this idea of the joy of the Lord being our strength is like we have to do it, the work to actually have that happen in our lives. We actually have to make that a habit. I think there's one thing that this world could use a whole lot more of, and that is celebrating God. A little bit of joy in our lives couldn't hurt anybody. That's what I want to build this year on, is the joy of the Lord being our strength. Maybe you're somebody who hasn't read the Bible consistently and you're like, hey, I just finished a Bible plan. We're throwing a party. Not in your house with masks off. That's not what I'm saying. But celebrate. Celebrate in some way. Make a big deal of doing what is right and what is good and what is holy. Make a big deal about it. Not to boast, not to, not, to, not to be cocky, not to do that, but to celebrate the goodness of our God. When God provides something in your life, celebrate it. When God does something good in your life, celebrate it. Do you kind of get the idea from this morning? 
celebrate the goodness of our God. Maybe you're in, you're in a place where you're like, it's hard to celebrate right now. It's hard to find joy right now. We're never, we're never going to get to the place where we are constantly living in the joy of the Lord, living in the strength of that, until we make that first step, until we move that first time, until we, we, we step out and say, hey, I know not everything is worth celebrating right now, but this one thing is, and I'm going to start making that a habit in my life. That's why in a couple of weeks, we're going to do a baptism Sunday because people want to get baptized. And you know what baptism should be for a, for a local church like ours? It should be the best day of the year. It's like Christmas, but we also have Christmas, you know? Because like Jesus. But baptism should be like that. It should be like something we anticipate and see coming. We're going we're gonna to have those baptisms, and it's open. If, you, if you're interested, uh, we will not be doing water gun baptism. I'm sorry. <laughs> Cam, your joke was funny, but we are not doing that. <laughs> we're going to do like good old-fashioned like donkey and water baptism. Because this is beautiful symbol of saying, my old life is being set down, and my new life in Christ is being raised up. And we're going to celebrate that. And you better believe that when that Sunday happens and when somebody goes down under the water and comes back up, signaling that new life in Christ, you better yell and scream like you do at the TV when the Chiefs are winning the Super Bowl. For a second time, except for those of you who are not Chiefs fans, just imagine with me your team winning, okay? Or for some of you, like Broncos fans, you don't have to imagine uh, your team has one. So, you know, those moments. That's what we need to do. We need to celebrate in that kind of way. We want to make a big deal about people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. I want to yell and scream at the top of my lungs because we're just full of stupid joy in what God is doing in our city. What God is doing right here. That we read about things in the scriptures, we read and we hear about things in the scriptures, the miraculous, the beautiful, the, the salvations, the baptisms, and we go, yeah, that, that looks like us. Because that's what the church should look like. Then here's, here's the last thing they do. They then obey. They realize in the scriptures that there's this thing called the Festival of Tabernacles that they should be celebrating in the literal month they're in. They, they do some digging, they figure this out. And so they're like, okay, we are celebrating the Festival of Tabernacles. That's what we're going to do because that's what the scriptures say. So they go and do that, and, and that's the, like... The tipping off point. It's awesome that we read the scriptures. It's awesome that we repent. It's awesome that we celebrate. Ultimately, we've got to get to the place where we live righteous lives, right? We've got to go to that place where we're actually living out the words that we heard in the scriptures. So here's the pattern. Read, repent, celebrate, obey. Read, repent, celebrate, obey. Read your scriptures. Read them from, from start to finish. There's always a different nugget that you are going to see, like, stand out to you. Ed and I were talking this morning in the lobby. He was like, I don't know why, but Matthew it was 513. Is that correct? Yeah. 513 stuck out to me. Matthew 513 stuck out to me. Ma I've been reading through the scriptures in, in, in the message because I want to just hear it in a little bit different way than I've heard it the last few years. And there's these, these wonderful times where I'm going, oh, I didn't think about it that way because I'm hearing it again and again. I want to read to you a couple of verses that you've probably heard. But I want to start this pattern for us with these couple of verses. 
We're going to start with reading. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be, of sh be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The word of the Lord has been read. And here's the part that we've got to take stock in our own lives and go, have I lived this command out? Or does it cause me to weep and mourn that I have not done it? I think ultimately all of us in some way or another have to say, God, I'm sorry for not prioritizing this first in my life. Jesus has been given all authority on heaven and, in heaven and on earth. And he's calling us to go and make disciples and baptize them. We've got to search our own lives and go, hey, I know I've, I've not made this the number one thing. I need to make it the number one thing in my life. And guess what happens now? We celebrate. We celebrate this turning from what we missed to where we're going. We're going to celebrate baptisms on the 31st. And here's my challenge to you. We should be celebrating the baptisms on the 28th of February. And we should be celebrating baptisms on the 31st of March. I know those are probably not Sundays. Okay, don't do the math on it. Uh... <laughs> We should be celebrating baptism every single month because we've seen people come to faith because that is what God has called us to and what he calls, what we've called in the scriptures, the Great Commission. It's the most important thing. We have to go and obey. We have to go and obey. So we've heard the word. Now we must do what it says. And with that, we are going to experience the celebration that follows. Amen? Let's pray and let's sing. God, this morning, would you lay this as a foundation in our lives? That we would read, repent, celebrate, and obey what you have called us to. God, I pray that right here in this moment as we've heard the Great Commission, as we've heard the words spoken to us, would you place people in our minds that we are going to minister to, that we're going to reach out to, that we're going to introduce Jesus to, this is our foundation for the year that the Great Commission will be done. Not completed, but participated in. We can't do it all on our own. But we can do it through your help. Because you've been given all authority on heaven and on earth. God, we love you. We thank you for who you are. Build on this today as we sing. In your name we pray. Amen.